Hey, dad was... worked for Nestle. Dad worked for Nestle, mate. The, the, the pre kick out today didn't really work too well. <laughs> yeah. This is potentially the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. And, and that's saying something because there's been some stupid stuff in the history. For me, what was the most rewarding, just learning, taking stuff out of them, and also being given this platform to be able to stand up and represent you know, people of my time. The only way really to do to kick poverty in the butt at all is through education, and I probably didn't realise until I went there. Sure, they should back you. It's a water cooler weekly. I mean, you know, it's a big deal. All right, it's my pleasure now to welcome the founder of the Pat Cronin Foundation, Matt Cronin. Matt, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Chris. So for those who don't know what the Pat Cronin Foundation is, give us a rundown on what the foundation is and sort of like what the message of the foundation is and you know what that represents and means. Yeah, sure. So, you know, the story behind Pat was on the 16th of April 2016, he went out uh, on a, for a quiet Saturday night and he never came home. Um, sadly, while he was out, one of his um, there was a bit of a fight at the, the venue that he was at, which was the Windy Mile up in in Diamond Creek, which is a you know pretty family friendly sort of place. Um, bit of music on that night. We we're pretty happy that he was going out to a you know night at the Windy Mile, not mm-hmm. not into King Street. Anyway, um, you know there was a bit of a fight. One of his mates got caught up in that, and Pat went to help him to drag him away from trouble. So he wasn't adding to the fight. He literally went to grab his mate and drag him out, and he was cow punched, yeah. um, hit from behind. Uh, he didn't get knocked out. <clears throat> he didn't hit the ground, uh, and he was walking and talking straight away afterwards. And um, but two hours later, um, he was complaining of a headache. Uh, he, he'd gone walk, but by that stage he'd walked back to his mate's place, which was, was only three or four hundred metres away. Um, said to his mates, "Listen, I've got a bit of a headache. Um, I think I might go home." So he rang Robin. Mm-hmm. Um, Robin answered the phone, and you know he said, "Can you come and get me? I've got a, I'm not feeling very well." Yeah. Didn't say anything about a, you know being hit or anything like that. By the time Robin got there, which is only like five minutes from here. Um, he was being carried down the steps by his mates and yeah. he was pretty much unconscious at that point. So he'd had a seizure. Yeah. You know, the boys rang an ambulance, Robin rang me. By the time I got there, he was laying in the driveway and, you know, an ambulance arrived pretty pretty soon after. Um, eventually he got taken to the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Um, you know, no lights and sirens. So, you know, a yeah. bit of a telltale sign, I think. Then we didn't really know what was going on at that point, but you know, only a matter of hours later, you know, they said that um, Pat had had a major bleed on his brain and they couldn't operate. Yeah. So later that day, um, you know, we were told that it wasn't survivable. And the next day, we turned his life support off. So. Yeah. The 18th of April 2016 is the day that we we acknowledge, if you like, that it was the day that Pat passed away. The irony of it is on his death certificate actually says the 17th of April yeah. because he was officially brain dead on the 17th of April. So those 48 hours are the worst 48 hours of our life, um, you know, when one of your kids doesn't come home. So shortly after, we decided, um, you know, we came back here and we had a house full of people come around. They just wanted to wrap their arms around us. Yeah. And, you know, that's when the seeds of the Pat Cronin Foundation were formed. So, yeah, we, we set up a foundation in Pat's name. You know, the number one intention for there is to honour Pat with mm-hmm. everything we do. So we don't want to do anything that sort of people would say, oh, gee, you know, who are these idiots, if you like, talking. So we, we're just who we are, though. You know, we're, you know, I, I've said this many times, we're just... Uh, Mum and Dad, you know, Robin and myself, uh, Mum and Dad from Eltham. Um, we're just normal people from a normal suburb. And we want to share a story about what happened to Pat so it doesn't happen to anyone else. Yeah. yeah. I think I, I read that on your website, you know, and it sort of it really hit me personally where it said, you know, we were just a, we were just a normal family, Pat mm-hmm. was just a normal kid. You yeah. know, this can happen to us. Yep. Um, it can happen to anyone. Absolutely anyone. You know, Pat was... You know, we're, you know, we're being told by the doctors, you know, Pat was extremely unlucky, but he was hit in the head, right? Mm-hmm. He was hit, hit in the temple, which is the thinnest part of his skull. And, you know, the skull's a very fragile object. And, yeah. and at this point here, you know, where, where, where he was hit, um, it didn't break the skin. You know, there was no cut. 
um, there wasn't even a mark on him, and yet the punch was thrown from behind where Pat had no chance to defend himself, so a classic coward punch, and, um, but it was thrown with enough force that it fractured his skull, yeah. and that caused the bleed on the brain, which you know, became inoperable. Yeah. Mm. L- let's talk about the, you know, you sort of touched on there about the, you know, the, the foundation was set up to, to honour Pat. Mm. Talk about the message be wise sure. and sort of the, you know, sort of the key, the, the key foundations that you wanted to s- sort of put around the foundation. Yeah, sure. So the, look, the be wise message, uh, I guess, yeah, when we've sort of thought long and hard about the foundation and, you know, what we wanted to stand for, I guess, you know, in a way you could say, what well, you know, what are we trying to sell? Mm-hmm. Right? And, you know, you have to think of it like a business ultimately. Um, but we, we want we want change in society is really what we, we want. That's that's what it's about. So whilst our, our you know our mission if you like is to have a society free from coward punches, mm-hmm. how do we do that? Right? And for us it's about changing people's attitudes towards violence. So so you know, I, I think I said it the other day that, you know, violence is actually a learned behaviour. Yeah. Right? So, you know, there's nothing more innocent than when you see two young kids playing together who have got no, you know, that they haven't had the chance to learn anything other than yeah, just the pure joy of, you know, interacting with another human being. Mm. And so, you know, how is it that people become violent? Well, it's a learned behaviour. Yeah. You know, they, they observe it around them. They might see it on TV or wherever, but it's ultimately learned. So we've got a, you know, our message about being wise, you know, it's a bit of an optimistic message to say if people are wise then you know, it's a positive thing to be, is to be wise. Because if you're wise, you're not going to throw a punch, mm. right? You're not going to do things that put other people in harm. So, you know, our children's storybooks that we released last year, for example, I think have got some beautiful messages in them. So these are aimed at primary school children that we say, be wise, think carefully, act kindly. I mean, if everyone lives their lives that way, you're not, going to, you're not going to get involved in social violence. Yeah. You know, there won't be a fight. There won't be a punch thrown. So, so it's sort of building blocks, if you like, if you like, to, towards ending the cow punch. So we do all of these behaviours. We then get to the point where, well, if there is no social violence, you can't be hit by a cow punch. Yeah, exactly. Right? So, you know, the end goal is let's let's end the cow punch, but probably the starting point is for to actually change people's behaviour. Let, let's talk about Pat. Yeah. What was it about that what was about him that made him such a special kid that everyone loved? Look, it's funny, you know, um, because we we just think of, you know, Pat as a, the youngest of our three kids, you know, Emma's Emma's now twenty nine, Lucas is twenty seven and if Pat was here he'd be twenty four, going on twenty five. But yeah, Pat was the youngest of our three kids. Uh, he was the baby of the family. Yeah. Um, but he was a good kid. Um, you know, look, he, he loved his footy, uh, but he loved his, you know, he loved his family, he loved his friends. Um, and he, he liked nothing better than just coming out and having a good time with his mates. So, you know, I think he, he was just a likeable sort of kid. Yeah. Uh, he was pretty quiet. Um, you know, we often say, what would he be thinking about now? You know, here we are talking about, you know, this kid called Pat Cronin. I mean, he, he, would never, he was never one to sort of seek the spotlight. Mm. Um, you know, he was, he was captain of his footy team in under-16s and under-17s, but he was that real quiet sort of captain. Yeah. You know, he didn't say a lot, but when he said something, kids, people would listen. Away. Yeah, absolutely, because he wasn't one to rant and rave. But, you know, occasionally, you know, in a couple of critical games, you know, I remember seeing him actually pull the team in. I thought, wow, hang on, what's he yeah. saying sort of thing? And I don't know what he said, yeah. um, to be honest. But, you know, the, when you see a team lift after, you know, he, uh, the captain said a few words. So, you know, one of his coaches who, you know, used to play down at Lower Plenty uh, in the seniors here, Kieran McInerney, Kieran was always one for uh, giving kids nicknames. And, you know, mm. his nickname for Pat was Skipper. Yeah. Right. So, you know, he was the skipper of the team, captain, yeah. captain of the team. But, yeah, so I think Pat, he sort of led his life by actions, not mm. by words necessarily. Uh, and he was a smart kid. You know, mm. as I said, as much as he loved his footy, um, he studied hard. You know, he, he, he ended up with a scholarship at La Trobe Uni yeah. um, to study sports. Um, what was it again? Um, um, oh, I'm going to say um, he was... 
what was his, I'm just trying to think what he's, no, health, no. health science. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah um, and, you know, but the view there is he wanted to become a physiotherapist. Yeah. Um, he didn't quite get enough marks to get directly into physio, but, you know, he had an ATAR of 94, which mm -hmm. was pretty handy. 94 more than mine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, and mine probably yeah. as well. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that that was who he was. He just put his head down and if he wanted something, he just worked his butt off to, to do it. Yeah. yeah. Talk, talk about, you know, seeing that you mentioned there and him sort of, bringing in the team and mm. you can sort of see it lift. What was that like to experience as a dad? Like uh, you, you say you yeah. sort of, you, you see him as a certain way, as a yeah. quiet kid and then you yeah. sort of see that, like that must yeah. have been pretty cool. It was, yeah, yeah. Because look, I, I mean, I, I was not a footballer by any stretch, you know, I might have played 50, I, I think I would have struggled to have played 50 games of junior footy, yeah. to be honest. And, you know, I lived my football dreams through my boys, you mm -hmm. know, Lucas first and then, and then Pat. You know, Lucas is still playing now. But, you know, I love watching them play. Yeah. And, you know, look, I, I, I couldn't, um, you know, as I said, I wasn't a player. I did coach one year. I coached Lucas's team one year and we, we had a bit of fun. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we made finals. Yeah, we made, we made the finals, which was pretty, yeah. I was pretty happy about. But it was, um, yeah, I could, but it's funny because my relationship with Lucas is that I could coach Lucas because Lucas would listen to me, but I couldn't have, I could Have never have listened? coached Pat. No, no, I could not have coached Pat. Um, yeah. It was just something that wasn't quite there, and you know I didn't want to butt heads with him, so I yeah. never put myself forward to be a coach of his team. Yeah, but there was probably always had the bit more qualified people than me to coach anyway. So you know I was the president of the footy club, I was on the committee. Those that that was my involvement with footy, and you know I was there, sort of always observing, mm. always watching, and yeah, to see to see him sort of gather the team together like that. You know, I think the the absolute highlight of me for his, from a footy perspective, because it is a team sport, mm. in under 16s he was a captain and they won the grand final. Yeah. Uh, and it was a it was an amazing day. It was still the best day of footy that I'd been to mm. until 2016. Yeah. And in 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 that moment, um, yeah, in that game, it was a they were the best team all year, Pat's team, mm. and we ex were expected to win the grand final comfortably. Anyway, but they were playing against Diamond Creek, and and they were behind. And Always nice to beat Diamond Creek. Yeah, I yeah, absolutely loved that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And anyway, they had a good rivalry against Diamond Creek. He was, they were behind, and Pat absolutely took a specky. Yeah, right? and he was, he wasn't a you know a massive overhead mark, but he took, he, he floated across the front of the pack yeah. and took this mark, and it's on YouTube. You can yeah. see, you can see this. So we, you might be able to edit that in. Yeah, find no, the, I will. Find, yeah. the, find the footage of yeah. this mark, and he goes back, and I'm thinking because he was a backman, he yeah. was a halfback flanker. I'm thinking, pass it, pass it. You yeah. know, give it to someone who can kick a goal. And anyway, he went back, and he slotted it from a, probably about 40 meters out, yeah. um, which is a pretty big kick for an under 16, and. Anyway, he's just sort of given a quiet fist pump and yeah. he's running back to the no. the centre. The camera's following him as he's running back to the centre. Yeah. And, you know, all these players are patting him on the back and, and that was the goal that put him in front and they yeah. held on and won the grand final. And he just gave a little fist pump. It was just a sort of yeah. play. You know, it was not, you know, he, no he, he might have showed a little bit of emotion, yeah. but it was just, you know, not, not the over-exuberant, you know, full forward who's just kicked him, you know, a good goal. It was just sort of... Yeah, okay. just sort of, yeah. yeah, just get on with my job. Yeah. You know, I'm going. Go, I'm going back to the centre because I've got to get the next clearance. Yeah. So it was, yeah, a very proud moment. You know, I've got to say, as a dad, you know, and you know, to see him ultimately be presented with the Premiership Cup was a, a really special moment. Yeah, I can only yeah. imagine. We were we were talking sort of before this started about, um, you know, as obviously we can see you're a very proud Richard man. I'm yeah. guessing Pat was also a passionate Richard man. Yeah, he was. I explained how, you know, the 2017 Premiership was, you know, sort of was sentimental to me in a way, mm -hmm. you know, because of, you know, my dad's a Richmond fan, a Richmond yep. tragic and yep. what he had gone through. Talk talk about that. Like, mm. I know some people might might find it, might find it silly, but, yep. you know, it's sort of sometimes sport does, yeah. you know, does, you know, sort of mean the world to people in certain moments based yeah. on things. So talk yeah. about that. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, Pat, yeah, as I said, he was he was born in Richmond, support, he didn't have a choice. Yeah. And he'd come to the footy, you know, he was a member basically all his life. Yeah. And he's he's still a member. Yeah. I, I haven't let his membership lapse. Yeah. And I still have a reserve seat for him every week when we go to the footy. Yeah. Um, so, 
you know, from that perspective, you know, look, Pat did get to see Richmond play in a few finals, but when we had that run of getting beaten in the elimination final each year, yeah. um, the worst of that being in 2014, I think it was, uh, when we, we made a trip to Port Adelaide. I oh, know. <laughs> And you know the outcome of that. I think I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we, well. we, we, we did the road trip across to Adelaide. And At least you knew early. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> and then we, we, we were so pumped and we were going to spend the weekend in Adelaide. Yeah. And uh, anyway, after the game, you know, we've been pumped, as you, as you know. And yeah. Trent Cotchin, you know, because he kicked the wrong way and all of yeah. this sort of stuff. Anyway, we, uh, the game finished and I said, come on, boys, we're going home. Yeah. And, and we, we actually drove home that night because yeah. I didn't want to be another I didn't want to be another minute in Adelaide yeah, uh, with, I, with Port I mean, Adelaide. <laughs> I don't blame you for that. Yeah, so yeah, what was the positive I'll take out of that trip is that um, Pat got to get a, quite a few hours up in his, on his L's. On his L's. <laughs> so, <laughs> and he did some night driving on the way home. Yeah. We took it in terms, Lucas, myself and Pat driving home yeah. and we ended up getting, I think we pulled into the driveway here at about 3 a.m. Yeah. So uh, after getting out of it, South Australia as quickly as we possibly could. I've been in I've been in that spot before. I uh, mm-hmm. I drove I drove up to watch Port Adelaide play GWS in Canberra. Yeah, and uh, I thought it'd be a good idea. Yeah. We, we were yeah. we were okay at the time. Yeah, and uh, we lost by eighty eight points. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. kicked two goals, yeah. and I was in line for the toilet. Yeah, and missed both those goals. So <laughs> that was the first time I heard the GWS song, which yeah. sounds like a, a carnival yeah, song. Yeah, and yeah. I, yeah. I was tormented, and I yeah. pretty much. You know, my my dad was there. My dad was loving. My dad was loving every second of it, obviously. Yeah. And I was like, "Yep, yeah. yeah, we're going. Going. We're going. We're, going, we're, right going, we're going back yeah. to Melbourne. Yeah. We're, we're not staying here." Well, I understand exactly why he did that. Yeah. So yeah. So that you know. So that was yeah. As I said, Pat did get to see some finals, but never saw Richmond win a final. Twenty, you know, and uh, twenty seventeen when when Richmond ultimately got there. Um, yeah, we got tickets in the ballot. Yeah. Um, by that stage, you know, Pat had passed away, but you know, I I got three tickets, and um, Pat Pat was at that grand final. Yeah. And you know, look, greater things have been at work. I think you know since Pat's passed away, and I, I'm sure Richmond had a bit of a helping hand that day. Um, yeah. Yeah. I feel like for for what Richmond fans have gone through, mm. they had there was no way they were losing that. No. They, they no. had so they had so many things, yeah. you know, working. Working on their favour, and you know, yeah. obviously, not a lot of people are going to have you know a similar story to, to what you had. But mm. you know, I, I mentioned you know my, my dad's best friend who you know passed away, mm. Trevor Jerome, who used to go to the who used to go to the footy with, mm. and I know how much it meant to you know my dad and his yeah. son Mark, who's yeah. a, you know a, a very passionate Richmond man. I just mm. it's not, they've just been through Richmond fans have been through so much. It was yeah. almost like there was like you know oh, oh that's enough. Yeah, Ooh. that's it. It's, we'll it's, our, it's our time. Sure, yeah. it has to be our time. So I, I was okay with that. Yeah, yeah. Con- thinking it was going to be one. Yeah. I don't think you were going to have a, a room full. There we of, go. Three. You run out. You run out of room up yeah, here. That's it. Yeah, I've, I've got to make it. Yeah, we've got to do an extension. Yeah, so we can get some more posters up. It's, we're not done yet. No, so, unfortunately, it doesn't look like you're done. No. But um, mm. what both yourself and your family had to go through is something that no family should have to go through. Mm. How? How does your family pick themselves up after something like this? Oh, look, it's tough. You know, that's that's reality. You know, we're we're five years down, and I don't know that it gets any easier. Yeah. Um, you know, we I think we just bounce back a little bit quicker. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've just gone, as I said, we've just gone past Pat's fifth anniversary, and it's those sort of milestone times. You know, like even last Sunday, Mother's Day. Yeah, you know, Robin's got a tear in her eye most of the day because one of her kids isn't here. Mm. So, you know, how do you reconcile that? You know, birthdays, you know, it was uh, Lucas's birthday recently and then it's our birthday, you know, Robin's and my birthday back to back in yeah. May. So, you know, there's always that empty chair. Um, so it, it is hard. Um, I won't say it's easy, but, you know, I think maybe externally we put on a pretty strong persona, but I can tell you there's plenty of times where we sort of curl up on the couch here and, you know, just, just cry. Um mm. It was funny, we, we had an art exhibition for the foundation and um, it was just something totally born out of COVID. We thought, what can we do? Because yeah. we, couldn't, we couldn't do many other things that we wanted to do with the foundation because schools were closed and things like that. So anyway, we, we had this idea to have an art exhibition and we had our, that, that ran through the month of April yeah. and it was a great success down at Yeah, And we had 40 artists um, you know, put up so many pieces. And in fact, the, the painting that you can see behind me here yeah. 
It's actually a painting. A, it's actually a painting. And a lot of yeah. people look at it and think it's a black and white photo. Yeah. But it's actually a painting of Pat. So that was just one of the many pieces of art. Yeah. Uh, so they weren't all portraits, but, but I tell you what, every time I looked at a portrait, I thought, oh my God, you yeah. know. And that was a really emotional experience. Um, I can imagine. That, that, yeah, so we had an opening night and, you know, we had some speeches where I gave a bit of an update on what's going on in the foundation. And I just started crying. Yeah. You know, just, I, it just absolutely overwhelmed me. Mm. And, you know, I'm not afraid to cry. No. Um, and I might, might well cry today, I'm not sure, yeah. but, you know, I'm okay with that. And I think that's that's good, it's healthy. Um, yeah. You know, so you do have to, you know, we have to talk about Pat because, mm -hmm. you know, Pat was a big part of our lives and, you know, we're going to make sure that people remember him, yeah. you know, because of the kid that he was, you know, and he was a normal kid, as we said, yeah. you know, and it shouldn't have happened. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And, and I think that's, you know, there's plenty of people who've lost children, you know, through illness um, or injury or something like that. But, you know, to lose a child the way we did, it just should never happen. No. So, yeah, you know, that's that's why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah, and the, the, the picture there is, mm. for, for people who might be able to see in the camera, mm. is a very stereotypical Australian in America photo. Yeah, yeah. You're in the Golden Gate Bridge and an it. AFL footy. Yeah. An AFL footy yeah. within. Yep. Yeah, well, that was the yellow, Sharon. So when yeah. we, about maybe six or seven years earlier, we did a trip of Europe. Yeah. And, you know, at that stage, the boys were, I think Pat was nine and Lucas was 11. And I thought, gosh, we're, gonna, we're doing a, a, a three three week sort of brave, you know, brave parents. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a three week sort of Griswold family holiday yeah. sort of thing. And we thought, what am I going to do to keep the boys occupied while on this bus trip? So I thought, I'm going to take the footy. Yeah. So everywhere we went in Europe, we had a little, little red Sharon. Yeah. And the boys would have a kick of the footy. We get off the bus. I said, come on, boys, let's go and have a kick of the footy, just to exert some energy. Yeah. And yeah, the looks we got all around Europe from these boys, yeah, you know, kicking the footy. Yeah. And they were taking marks and handballing it, and yeah. people. Were just looking like, at it what, thinking, what's, what's going on yeah. here? So, so I thought, well, when we went to America and did this trip, I thought, well, we're not, we can't take the red Sharon, we've got to take the yellow Sharon. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's the yellow Sharon that he's holding. And the, the fine detail on that, you can see he's written his name on I it. I can, yeah, I was going to say, yeah. it's, a, it's, yeah. it's so, incredible amount of detail. Yeah, 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 amazing. So, but it was a, you know, that that's one thing that, you know, I'll be forever grateful for. We did a lot of travel with the kids. Yeah. Um, we were fortunate enough to go overseas a, a few times. But, you know, Pat's memories, you know, of trips to Wilson's Prom mm -hmm. and to Inverloch and to the Murray, um, where we were just bush camping, yeah. you know, they were just as strong as what, you know, mem memories of trips overseas were. Uh, and I, you know, I, there's still some of our fondest memories as well. Yeah, so, I, I can I can think back to you know my grandparents used to have a, a place down in Point Lonsdale. Yep. And uh, every Christmas day we would have lunch with my grandparents in Montmorency, and then we would go down for we would go go down there, and you know it doesn't sound like much to to some people, but f for me as a kid, you know I, I loved that. The, that two day period, you know, the next day you boxing day test, yeah, you know, just sort of sitting on the couch, yeah. you know, it's stinking hot, yeah. but watching the cricket with my dad, like, yeah. Yeah. It, it's funny, like, I've, I've been very fortunate enough to travel, to do a lot of traveling myself, but mm -hmm. I do sort of think about, you know, those sort of things as experiences as a, as a kid and sort of, they do, you know, carry just as much weight as, mm -hmm. you know, say some of the experiences I've been lucky enough to have overseas. Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, I think, you know, again, was one thing that I made a conscious decision of, you know, in my life, um, you know, through my working life, is to be there at all the milestones of the kids. First, yeah. day, first day of school, graduations, you know, I didn't miss anything. You know, yeah. never, never missed a parent-teacher. They're the sorts of things that I figure, well, we're raising the kids. We've mm -hmm. got to be there. And, you know, and it was about probably just demonstrating to the kids that, you know, we, we were always around. We may not have been in their face necessarily, but... You know, things like the footy club, as I say, that's why I jumped on the committee. Yeah. Um, you know, Auskick, you know, I helped coordinate Auskick. It was, a, you know, chairperson of the school board. Um, all of those little things, Robin ran the parents and friends. Yeah. Um, she was on the committee. She's still on the committee at Lower Plenty now. Yeah, wow. You know, so I think it's just sort of, it was in our DNA a little bit. And, and it was about probably, you know, helping set some values for the kids. Yeah. You know, and I think if, if you lead, you know, as I said, we talked about learned behaviours before, yeah. you know, hopefully... That I, you know, we're we're giving our kids a positive example to say, well, you know, look, if you, you know, um, if you put into something, you might get a better outcome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's also, you know, you're sort of removing some of those potential what ifs as mm -hmm. a parent. You know, mm -hmm. like, well, what if I miss this, yeah, or yeah. what if I would, you know, yeah, 
Yeah, that's yeah. Incredible. I mean, I, I could have, you know, gone down a particular path with my career. You know, I'm a financial planner, and I, yeah. I talk to people every day, and I share stories and and uh, listen to their stories and things like that. But you know, for me, um, you know, it was about that work life balance to say I want to be there for the kids. You know, yeah. if the client wants to see me. I said, well, here's the terms you see me on. Yeah, exactly. Right? Um, I, you know, because I've got to, I'm not going to miss my sons. You know footy training or, yeah. you know, presentation night or whatever it might be, you know, that all those special moments, you know, whether that's Emma or Lucas or Pat, we were there for all of them. Yeah, absolutely. That's incredible. Mm. Um, I know before when we were setting this up, you sort of spoke about dealing with the grief um, and, you know, I sort of just asked you, you know, how you pick yourself up, but mm. how as a family have you, you know, dealt with the grief and then use that to harbour something positive mm. and, you know, create the foundation? Mm. Mm. Yeah, look, as I said, I, I, I really can't explain it in many ways. Yeah. You know, like we said before, you know, who would have thought I'd be sitting here having, a, you know, doing a podcast about my son who was killed? Mm. You know, if you had said that to me six years ago, I would have just sort of, you know, laughed at you sort of thing. But um, I don't think I could be that person, but it's who we've become. Uh, but, yeah, as I mentioned before, we've been involved a lot in community and, you know, it's probably through, you know, my parents and Robin's parents who were always involved in different things yeah. and probably just having seen them around, you know, even stories like, um, you know, as a kid, we always had a holiday. You know, Dad was a public servant, so not highly paid, but um, we always had holidays. Yeah. And Dad always had holidays being a public servant, you yeah. know, unlike a you know, self-employed person who never takes time off work. Dad absolutely took his, you know, his time off work and... We'd have a holiday down to, you know, an uncle's house or an auntie's house, you know, which didn't cost probably much. Yeah. But we had a holiday. Or we'd go out to the airport and watch the planes land, yeah. you know, simple little things, or go on a picnic up into the Dandenongs. So I guess, you know, that probably learning from our upbringing almost to say be around and, and be involved, yeah. and I suppose it just sort of just almost became natural, you know, for us when this happened to Pat, we thought, oh, gosh. What do you do? How do you, how do you cope with this? We could have just sat in the corner here, as I say, and wallowed, and no one would have, no, no one would have, you know, no one would have been upset if we had done that. But I guess I came back to think about the things that we, how we raised our kids, and yeah. you know, one of the things I've said to, you know, to Emma and to Lucas and to Pat the whole way through, you know, from right when they were little little kids, is whatever they do in life, just give it your best. Mm -hmm. Right, and if you if you give it your best and that's not good enough, then you know what, that's okay. Right? Because there might be someone who's better than you or whatever, but give it your best. But if you if you haven't given your best and then and then you you know you, you're sulking about that, to me that's not how you want to live your life. So for me, I guess giving my best in this case is how can I? I can't bring Pat back. Yeah. Nothing can bring him back, and that's <laughs> extremely sad. Yeah. You know that he's not here, seeing Richard win three flags. Yeah. You know. Um, Yes, uh, you know, seeing seeing so much of what's happened in, in you know with his mates' lives, you know, weddings and babies happening, and he's not there to be a part of it. So how can we sort of honour him the best way we can? It's you know to share his story, I guess, and say that hey, look, if someone else can learn from this, and you know, if we can change someone else's behaviour, then that'll be a great thing. Yeah, yeah. I know a lot of the stuff that the foundation tries to. Uh, or the work that it does to prevent, mm. it, it's it's not measurable. No. You know, no. and, and yeah. it's almost like, you know, parents will see their kids go out at night, they come home, yeah. and, and they won't even, they won't even sort of realise, uh, is is that is that difficult to, to sort of know that mm. it's very hard sometimes for, you know, to, to, to measure that or yeah. to measure so, the success? Yeah, look, it, it is tough because statistics, you know, and governments and, you know, organisations that, you know, what we're, we're approaching to get funding, they want statistics. Yeah. And, you know, we, we've, we've talked about this, you know, at, 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 you know, with our employees and with our, our board on the foundation is to how do you measure a punch that never gets thrown? Yeah. Right? Yeah, and, you can't. You can't. You yeah. can't measure that. But... You know what, like things like these wristbands that we we sell, and you know these wristbands were Lucas's idea. Yeah. And, you know when when he 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 bought them, ordered them online probably a week or so after Pat passed away, and we we took them took the first batch which was two hundred wristbands, 
which he paid for out of his own pocket. We took them down to the local footy, mm. um, and I can still remember the, the who we were playing and where we were playing. We were playing Northcote Park, yeah. and we were playing them down at the Bill Laurie Oval, yeah. right down there in West Garth Street. And Lucas had a bag full of these wristbands, and I thought to him, oh, 200 wristbands, you know, what are we going to, how much are we going to sell them for, and will we sell them all, and mm. how many are we going to be stuck with? Well, we sold 200 wristbands that day. Yeah. And since then, we made another order, of, you know, 500, and then the next order was 10,000. Yeah. So, but these wristbands stop, have stopped fights. Yeah. You know, we know stories around here where, you know, Pat's friends, or in fact, actually one of, one of Pat's best mates, his younger brother, was at a party, and there was a fight about to start between the two guys for no particular reason. Yeah. And, you know, young Ben stood up between them and held up his wristband and just said, guys, just stop. Yeah. You know, just stop. You know, think about Pat Cronin and what happened to him. Mm. And the fight stopped. Yeah. And it's like, holy crap, you know, this stuff works. Yeah. Right? So sharing the story. So, yeah, can we measure it? No. no. But we hear lots of stories. You know, we, we're, our big thing these days is about education at schools. The, the testimonials we've had from schools, just, you know, every, every presentation we get is amazing. But, you know, I was reading one just last week where a teacher actually said the behaviour in the schoolyard, so this is secondary schools, the behaviour in the schoolyard the following week was noticeable, mm. right? The, the change in behaviour was noticeable. So that says something to me, you know, so... You know, and whether that's just someone thinking twice or being wise, you know, to yeah. use it, you know, to, um, with their choices, uh, it's because we're teaching kids. You know, we're we're sharing a story, and they might just in the back of their mind just think, "Oh shit, remember, you know, when that kid got hit?" Because mm. um, you don't, when you throw a punch, you don't know what the outcome's going to be. Absolutely not. You do not know. Um, so you know, I think even just with the Richmond thing on the weekend, you know, I was asked, I was I was on the news on Tuesday night. Yeah, Channel 7 News came to me yeah. to get a comment about what I thought, you know, what Damien Hardwick had said about, you know, we don't condone the behaviour, but we can understand it. Well, should we understand it? Maybe not. Yeah. Right? So, but but we've got to teach these guys. So, you know, to quote Dima, and, you know, I'm a mad Richmond supporter, and when we get beaten, you know, Damien Hardwick is really strong on saying um, we take this loss as a gift. We've mm. got to learn from this. Absolutely. Right? That's a really good, and, really good phrase to use. Yeah, I think it is. You know, so I think it's great at sport, but you yeah. know what? It is in life as well because mistakes happen. Yeah. And, you know, it is hard to put a young head on old, you know, an old head on young shoulders. But you know what? You can teach it, right? Mm. You can teach this stuff. And, you know, you know, you look at it in the AFL. You know, they've constantly got coaches teaching them where to run to and how to do this and how to do exactly, that. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it is a, you know, again, come back to that phrase I used before, it's a learned behaviour. Mm. So if violence is a learned behaviour, then not being violent can also be a learned behaviour. Yeah. So we've got to teach it and say, when you get confronted this with, with this situation, what's your natural reaction? And let's, let's change that natural reaction to say, well, I'm not going to be a part of this. I don't want to accept this. Yeah, exactly. You know, I think about licensed venues where a lot of these things happen. If you went to every... License, licensee and ask them, do you want more fights at your venue? What are they going to say? No, obviously. They don't want it. You know, yeah. you go to the MCG, like you said you did before, and there was a fight there. Mm. The MCG doesn't want fights. Yeah. Right? You talk to most people, they don't want fights. No one wants it. Yeah. You, you don't want it happening next to you. Yeah. you know, it's sickening when it happens. So if so many people don't want it. Why does it happen? Yeah, yeah. So because there's still an element of society that needs to be changed. Yeah. So I think a lot of the time we're talking to con the converted, we're talking to people who don't want this to happen. Yeah. And that's, but, you know, I think one of the strengths that we have with our foundation is that we have a cause that no one can argue with. Absolutely. No one wants more violence. Yeah. Right? No one. So we are just got to keep chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. And, you know, I, I, and I, I look at the AFL as a big example for us. And, you know, I know, you know, Pat was a footballer and I love footy and, and you know, Robin loves footy, Amber and Lucas love footy as well. But you think about the AFL, it's changed over, you know, probably the last 10, 20 years. Mm. 10, 20 years ago when there was fights all the time and, you know, punches were thrown and, and coward punches were thrown, let's face it. It's very rare these days that you see a cow punch thrown on a footy field yeah. um, because they're so disciplined, right? They're trained 
to not react to these things. You know, I love Dustin Martin, for example. You know, yes, he's got the tats and the neck tats, and people look at him and think, oh, he's a big tough guy. But you watch the way he plays. He's one of the fairest players that ever plays the game. Yeah. And he just, because he is so focused on what his job is, which is to get to the next contest. Yeah. Uh, I love it. You know, so, and that's just all training. You know, and I think one thing that Richmond's done is with their mindfulness training. With Emma Murray. Yeah. She's incredible. Incredible. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I look at that and I think, wow, if you can change some, you know, if you can get someone to react that way and, and um, just focus on what it is that they can control, yeah. you know, that's what it's all about. You can't control how good your opponent is, but maybe you can run in different patterns to stop them being able to get to the next contest and things like that. Yeah. So, but it's all about discipline and, and learned behaviours. Yeah, and I think ultimately that's the that's the power mm. of storytelling. Mm. You know, mm. if you let's say to do a hypothetical, let's go to Viewbank College where I went to school. Yep. You've got a thousand kids there. Yep. I can go out and you know, do a speech and, and tell the story and, you know, the engagement will obviously be there. Mm-hmm. But if you put yourself up there mm. as Pat's father, mm. someone who's who's gone through it, mm. I guarantee you can hear a pin drop. Ah, every, and those, every presentation we do. You yeah. Know, and look, again, we've got a, you know, I don't do many presentations these days. Um, you know, my, my I think my, my job is not necessarily to, to be out there at schools because you know I've got a full time job, yeah. and, but but we've got people who do that for us. Mm. So we've got an amazing team of presenters who have all got a connection through to Pat somewhere along the way. Yeah. And you know when you hear them, you know I've gone and observed them and watched them present, and the reaction we get is exactly the same every time we present. And it's it's to see these young kids, you know, anywhere from say year eight up to year year twelve generally, you know, to see them transfixed and, and absolutely focused and listening to the point where you, you know you can't hear a pin drop uh, can hear a pin drop um, it's it's quite an, it's it's a very powerful thing yeah, yeah. Well, I was gonna say, yeah. What, what are you like in those moments you know you're ah. sort of standing up the back yeah when when I the first presentation I did we put together a PowerPoint and we put together our scripts and stuff like that and I had no idea of the impact it was going to have yeah. We thought it would work. That's what we did. Yeah, we we yeah. literally thought it would be okay. Mm-hmm. But then, so we, we, we had we had a documentary filmed five years ago. Yeah. Right? It, was, it was in August after Pat died. So a good friend of ours, who's become, a guy who's become a good friend of ours, Ruben Street, he's an um, independent filmmaker and lives over in Coburg. And Ruben filmed this documentary for us, which is still takes my breath away when I watch this documentary. Mm-hmm. We, we, we play about 10 minutes of that documentary in the in, when we do a presentation. But we get the, we get the audience talking beforehand, mm-hmm. uh, just sharing stuff, yeah. you know, about uh, in the first instance it's sort of sharing uh, things about, you know, um, aggression and violence, yeah. right? Just, just getting them to say how do you deal, you know, what happens to you physically, etc. So there's real interaction there, and you you get them talking amongst themselves, and you see the group, and they're animated, and they're talking quite you know openly and loudly. Then we then we show the video, and then we ask them after the video to then amongst the same group just have a bit of a chat about what they thought about the video yeah. and and ideas, you know, and what their key takeaways were. And this was something that was never scripted as such, but when we play that video and you and when you watch the groups afterwards, all of a sudden they're all leaning in yeah. and their voices drop. And all of a sudden it's just got real serious. And it's like, holy crap, I just never yeah, we didn't think that, that we didn't expect that that was gonna happen. Yeah. But it, it's it's like you act you know, often what I've said in the past, I said, Can I just make an observation? Who turned the volume down? Yeah. Right? Because prior, you guys were all raucous and you know, yeah. we were having a sort of call for quiet. Now all of a sudden it's hushed tones and, and you know, in my you know, my, my, my plant language is I said, you know what, this shit's real. Yeah. Right? This isn't a made up story. And by sharing a story what as powerful as, you know, the worst possible outcome that you could ever have yeah. from a violent episode. Um people realise, you know, that and that they look at the story because it's 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 friends of Pat's, um, it's it's Emma and Lucas, it's Robin and myself, 
just sharing their their perspective. Yeah, you know, their experience of what happened, mm-hmm. you know, and, and the impact on them. And that's when people realise they look at Pat and think, Oh, it could have been my brother. It could have been my son, it could have been my boyfriend, it could have been my teammate, could have been my me. schoolmate, it could have been me, hundred percent. And that's the story of a real boy. Yeah. Right? Not not a made up kid, not an AFL superstar, mm. you know, not not anyone from Hollywood. This is this is just a kid from a normal suburb. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that uh, a lot of a lot of things that sort of happen, you know, whether that whether that be the um, the the racial issues is, racial issues going on in America or you know or, or whatever it may be mm. a lot of people will hear about it but they won't necessarily react to that emotion because they don't have a there's no face on that no there's no face on that you know that issue for them mm. and mm. You, know, you talk about you know playing a video mm. I, I'm guessing the video probably has you know footage of 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 Pat as mm. a kid yeah. Yeah, and then yeah. that, I'm guessing, would hit, you know, kids at that age like a sledgehammer. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, as I said, you look at Pat, and look, Pat was 19 when he was killed. Mm. But he looked like he was 16 or 17. Mm. And, and then when we're showing it to these high school audiences and stuff, they can they can imagine that that might have been them. Yeah. And I think that's what resonates with them. You know, they, they look at that and think, oh, my God, that could have been me. You know, I've been at a party. I've been out at night. I've seen a fight. Yeah. Or I've gone in and I've thrown a punch. Yeah. You know, sometimes we ask a question, you know, who's seen a fight? Yeah. Hands everyone puts, everyone their, hand puts their hands up. Yeah. You know, have you stood in the schoolyard and, you know, sort of formed a circle and said, fight, fight, fight? You know, got yeah. that real adrenaline rush, sort of seeing it as a bit of entertainment almost. Um, that's what they'll say. Yeah. And then we show that video and we'll ask a question. How do you feel about fights now? Yeah. yeah. And, and it's like everyone sort of everyone sort drops their heads yeah. a little bit and thinks, oh, no, that's not on, you know. So, but it's got to be there. It's got to be constant. You know, we've got to keep drumming it in. You know, a bit like drink, drive, bloody idiot. Yeah. Um, you know, seatbelt campaigns. Yeah. You know, in the past, you know, when, when I grew up, <laughs> there was no seatbelts in the cars. Right? Yeah. So you didn't have a seatbelt to put on. Only the driver got one. Mm-hmm. Everyone else didn't have a seatbelt. Hard yeah. to believe, but that's how yeah. it was. But now, these days, it's it's everyone's got a seatbelt. And, you know, the kids will yell at you because, well, the car yells at you in the first instance yeah. if you haven't put your seatbelt on. Yeah. So, you know, so we can change. This, that, that's our view is that we can change, you know. But on the personal front, I just remembered something I wanted to say was that, you know, the reason we're called it the Pat Cronin Foundation and not the Coward Punch campaign or, or social violence campaign or anything like that is because it is about Pat. Yeah. It's always been about Pat. The only reason our foundation exists is because of Pat and what happened to him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe using a bit of an example with, say, the Alana and Madeline Foundation, you know, which is after the, you know, Walter Mickax, um, two girls who were killed at Port Arthur. Yeah. You know, it's it's personal, right? It is it is personal for us. But, but, you know, there's so many people, I guess through sharing our story, feel like they know Pat. Yeah. Because we've, you know, but... Who is Pat to them? You know, do they know him? No, they don't know him. You know, yeah. they don't know him as a cheeky little, you know, S H I T, who you know may not have you know tidied up his bedroom and you yeah. know, or never empty the dishwasher and things like that. He, you know, they they won't know him like that. But they they so whether it's that they think they know him personally or they know you know, hey, this is a kid who could have been ours. Yeah, and I think that's what connects people. With us. I think so, and I think like, you know I didn't know Pat mm. personally, but you yeah. know playing cricket yeah. at Lowell Plenty yeah. for most of my life, yeah. you know I, the way I sort of look at it and go is that you know it could have it could have been anyone, yeah. it could have been anyone here, and you know yeah. like just because he played footy and because I didn't know him personally mm. doesn't mean that I mm. you know didn't feel something when that happened. You know yeah. it's a yeah. it, you, you sort of talked about how community minded you are and mm. you know I sort of touched on well, I wasn't born in mm. Eltham but mm. I consider Eltham my home for yeah. for certain reasons and mm. you know when something does happen in this area you know especially like that you know it does sort of it, do, it does it does it hits me it, yeah um, it, it impacts you and, and yeah look I, I remember I met um or it was a former commission commissioner for the victims of crime Greg Davies who was a uh, former police um policeman yeah, head of the police, um, secretary of the police association for many yeah. years. And anyway, I met Greg at a rally. 
I'm not a big political person or anything like that, but I, I, I felt there was this rally in the city that I went to one day and it was about enough is enough. Yeah. We've had enough of violence and there was a, it was a horror, horror run of um, women in particular who'd been murdered, you know, by people who'd been let out on, um, on parole. Um, and, yeah. you know, it was just these are crimes that should never have happened. Anyway, I met Greg at this, um, this rally and he talked about the statistics of victim, victims of crime statistics, which are horrific right? yeah. when you think about how many people are victims of crime. Now, the year that Pat died, he goes down statistically as one victim. Mm. Right? In, all, in, the, in all of the statistics across Victoria, Pat was one, one victim. I'm not a victim, statistically. Yeah. Robin's not a victim. Emma and Lucas aren't a victim. Or, you know, um, Pat's grandparents weren't considered victims. His cousins weren't considered victims. His mates, his footy club, his cricket club, you name it, his school, you know. And, Such and, a wide... And before we knew it, you know, like, I mean, there was 2,000 people at Pat's funeral. Yeah. Right? And countless others who probably couldn't go. Yeah. You know, and, it, and, it's, and it's not a hint of exaggeration to say that, you know, Pat's death had an impact on probably tens of thousands of people, mm -hmm. right? You're one of them. Absolutely. Right? You know, as someone who calls Eltham home and you think, oh, my God, how could this happen to someone from our, our suburb? Mm. So, you know, I think about victims of crime and then I think this isn't one person, you no, know, this impacted. is, not a, this is, this, you know, the, statistic. the statistics are just so far wrong. You mm. know, you just think someone breaks into your car, right? It's impacted you, but then maybe your mum and dad have to come and get you. So it's impacting them. Mm. If they've got to give up work to come and get you to help you with your car, that's affecting the employer. You yeah. know, now that's a very minor thing, but again, when you think about the impact of some something like a death, like with Pat from a violent crime, the impact is massive. Yeah. Just it's, and, and and the cost cost of society is millions, millions. Yeah. Yeah. You know, millions. You know, because yeah. you know people who make people from this area who say don't know Pat, mm. they now they now don't have that level of comfort that they should yeah, when they right. when they're yeah. you know how do you put a price on that you say i'm not going to the windy mile anymore yeah which but as you which as yeah. you pointed out yeah. was you know was a family it's family a family venue. family venue yeah. and it yeah it's, it's one of those things that you know i i guess i didn't even you know sort of until you started you know scoping out you mm. know like it's mm. he's listed as you know one statistic but mm. here are the here are the people who are affected and they just, it sort of, it just the, goes. The ripple effect, you know, you've, you've thrown the stone in the pond, if you like, and yeah. the ripples just go out and out and out and just keep going out. Yeah. And, you know, like even even the homicide detectives who we dealt with who were amazing, um, they're victims. You know, one of the guys is no longer in the force because of Pat's death. Yeah. He's given it away. Um, so, you know, the, the knock-on effect, as I say, is, is, is huge. huge. Yeah. yeah, it really is. The work the Foundation does isn't just limited to these, you know, awareness sessions that you run. Mm. Um, you have the Be Wise Walk. Um, you, yeah. you touched on before about the, the art exhibition that you had featuring local artists. Yeah. I'd like to know what it feels like for you and your family when you sort of see the, the show of support, when you, mm. you get these amounts of people that, you know, come up to support you know, Pat, support yeah. the family, support the message. Like, how special is that for, for you and the family? Uh, it was amazing, really. It really is, you know, like the walk in particular. And, you know, again, uh, you know, that was uh, started by a couple of guys from the cricket club. Yeah. Um, you know, local guys who didn't know Pat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they wanted to do a, ch a walk for charity, contacted me, um, you know, Luke Anderson and, um, oh, geez, I'm going to forget these come back to it, Luke and Nick, Nick Carlton. Yeah. And, you know, they, they contacted us out of the blue and just said, random Facebook message, mm -hmm. we wanted to do a charity walk. Would you be interested in, in us supporting the, the Pat Cronin Foundation? Sick. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I just didn't hesitate. So I thought, who are these guys? So we went and met them. Um, they had ultimately uh, approached five charities, local charities. Yeah. And none of the others were interested. Really? And I thought... 
well, we'll help you out. You know, yeah. let's let's do this. So, so anyway, we we put our heads together and we came up with this. You know, they, they had already had the concept, the walk to the valley. Yeah. Um, it's now morphed into the the walk to the valley. You know, um, the Pat Cronin Foundation, the Wise Walk to the Valley. Yeah. Right. So, and the boys have been nothing but amazing. You know, the the first year that we had, we, you know, they thought they might get two hundred. I said, no, forget that. Yeah. We'll, we'll get five. We'll get five hundred. Yeah. Right. And we we smashed it. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, the next year we got over a thousand, and you know, we're close to two thousand. You know, I keep uh, I keep saying to the family, we're going to smash it. We're going to get more and more. But you know, COVID sort of got in the way, and you know, but we had a walk to anywhere last year where we still had over a thousand people participate yeah. in a virtual walk anywhere in the world so but yeah i remember that first walk you know we um the boys were hoping to raise maybe ten thousand dollars well, we raised 35 grand wow. it was just amazing yeah and you know to see the look on their faces when you know we told them how much we'd raised and <laughs> we were sitting in the humble little the old rooms at lower plenty there and to see these two boys um you know men um yeah. crying yeah you know over what they'd started was incredible yeah. um but to see how many people came to that walk and you know it was it, it was an amazing feeling you know and we had you know there was a second walk or the third walk maybe you know we had a lady um come all the way from apollo bay yeah and it was her 60th birthday or something like that and you know our husbands asked her what do you want to do for your birthday and he said, she said i want to go on the pat cronin foundation walk yeah. came all the way from Apollo yeah. Bay to do the walk and I'm thinking, oh my God, our message is getting out there. Yeah. This isn't just a Diamond Valley thing anymore. You know, this is a walk beyond the valley, let's yeah. say. And, you know, we've had, you know, since we've had the virtual walk, we've had people literally walking all around the world. Yeah. You know, so we've had people walk in London, we've had people walk in France, we've had people walk in America. Yeah, um, yeah not many, but... But it's, it's a start, still, you know, it's a start. And then something that we'll build on and build on and build on, yeah. What's that like when, you, you know, someone someone like that who, you know, doesn't have a connection to mm. the family, mm. you know, sort of says this message has yeah. not only reached me, but it's touched me so yeah. much that I want to get involved. Like, Yeah. I, look, I, I, it's really hard to put in words, to yeah. be honest, because I think that's when it really hits home that we've actually, our message is important. Yeah. You know, that it does go beyond family and friends. Um, it goes into the community and beyond just our little local community. People contact us, you know, um, you know, and our next big event, and you might be going to be asking me about this soon, mm. was about the, the ball, yeah. the BY's ball. Yeah, we weren't able to have a ball last year because of COVID, but, you know, the first ball we had, which was the year before, was a huge success. Yeah. And I remember sort of, sort of being there on the red carpet arrivals and watching people coming in and thinking, who are you? Yeah. Who are you? And I, you know, I, I thought everyone who was going to be there, I'd know. Yeah. But there was probably half the people I didn't know. Yeah, kind of just speechless almost. It does, you yeah. know, to think. And, and, you know, like with the walk, you know, I can say, oh, look, the walk's $35. It's not a biggie, you yeah. know, but the ball, you know, you're outlaying some serious dollars, yeah. you know, for 150 bucks, or this year's $175. Yeah. Um, you know, so to think that people have sort of put their hard earned money on the table to yeah. come along and support an event, I think is um, quite amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the, the cow punch laws. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I know you and the foundation have pushed quite hard on this and will continue to do. Yeah. Um, you spoke, you've spoken about how the law as it's written doesn't yeah. work. Correct. Um, talk about going through this, this part of the battle. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, I guess, um, you know, if I go back through the court process, uh, there's there's nothing good about the court process. It is brutal. Yeah. Right? That's the word that I've used many times. No it's, one means. It's, it's brutal. No, it, it is, there's no, there's no solace for victims. Um, victims yeah. don't get looked after. Victims are a, an unnecessary nuisance in the whole process. You know, if the public prosecutors had their way, there'd be no victims in the courtroom, you know, mm -hmm. because we just get in the way and they can just deal with the law. So I guess I've come to some sort of uneasy acceptance that um, the outcome that we got, ultimately, I said, we had to get a, we needed a guilty verdict is what we needed. Yeah. And we got one, yeah. right? Now, ultimately, you know, the coward who killed Pat, he pled not guilty for all that time until the third day of the trial. And then he changed his plea to guilty. 
Yeah. So he said, he was basically saying, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. Yeah. And then on the third day of the trial, after the jury was selected and, he, and the lawyers looked in the, the, the whites of the eyes of the jury and, and saw that this guy was fried, yeah. they then changed their mind and said, you better change your plea to guilty yeah. right, to get an easier sentence. That's the only reason you do it. Because this is a guy who said, I, you know, on the first day of court, when the judge asked him, how do you plead? He didn't say, you know, the judge says, how do you plead guilty or not guilty? He didn't yeah. say not guilty. He said, I am not guilty. Yeah. Right? It was such an arrogant statement, yeah. the way he said it. And the judge should have slapped him down, but he didn't. Anyway, three days later, he changes his mind and he says, I'm now guilty. So that was a point which was a bit of a, um, I guess, a moment for us to at least say, thank God, because we can now say someone did kill Pat. Because if we hadn't got a not guilty verdict, how do you reconcile that? I can imagine it'd be... It was was the biggest issue on my mind, is to say if if a jury somehow or other through a technicality, because that's all it would have been, because there was CCTV footage showing what he did, if there had been a, um, if if the jury had have said not guilty, and they didn't get the choice in the end, they didn't have to. But if he had have said not guilty, then we'd be saying, well, how did Pat die? Yeah. If we got a not guilty, I mean, it's just beyond a comprehension to even think about it. So, my satisfaction, if I can call it that, is that we know that someone did kill Pat. Yeah. And we got a guilty verdict. So. The sentence was never going to be enough. So what we've ended up with is, I guess, the only sentence that I think that I can be comfortable with is the fact that he needs to live with the fact that he killed Pat for the rest of his life. Yeah. All right. So you served as a victim representative on the Victorian government's Victim of Crime Consulative Committee. Yep. Talk about that experience and specifically the accomplishments that you were able to achieve during this term. Yeah. Look, it was... um, Again, I was approached and asked if I wanted to go on to it and there was an application process and, you know, I just thought, yeah, why not? You know, if it gives me an opportunity to comment on what it, our experience was, which was, you know, less than good, yeah. you know, then I thought, you know what, let's let's put my hand up again, you know, like we've done in so many things in life. So, yeah, look, it was a, it was a very humbling experience because, you know, I was one of seven victim representatives and... Each and every one of us as victims had horrific stories to tell and share. And, you know, we, we laid, our, laid our, um, our hearts bare in, the, mm. in those meetings. The scary part about it for me, though, was that there was... Um, we, in this committee, we, we were the victims' representatives, but there was also representatives from right across government, yeah. from various all, all the various sectors involved in the justice system. And... It was like many of them were hearing a victim story for the first time, which just I just could not understand. You know, they were they were asking us questions. You know, like to say, "Did that really happen?" And I said, "Yeah." Yeah. And I said, "This is your system, not ours." Yeah. Right. So how do you not know this already? Yeah. It was really scary. I think the fact that they didn't seem to you understand. know understand. Yeah, and it was like we were opening their eyes for the first time, and we weren't the first committee. You know, there, there's prior committees before us. So it just, yeah, sometimes it shows, you know, that you know, there's a saying that I use sometimes, you know, that you you don't see the forest for the trees, mm-hmm. you know, that they're so focused on minutia that they're actually missing the big picture here and, yeah. and what's actually going on. So, yeah, did we achieve a lot? Um, you know, I, I look back at the two years and it went way too fast. So one thing we did achieve is that we... we we at least lobbied to make sure that the terms were longer. Yeah. Because no sooner did, were we getting comfortable with the concept of having the Attorney General in the room and, you know, the Victims Minister and other senior, um, you know, judges and all sorts of people like that, you know, no sooner we were getting comfortable with this and then our term was over. Yeah. And, in fact, we were ripped off in that, you know, COVID, you know, lost us the last six months really. So yeah. there was a lot of momentum lost. Uh, I think the biggest so, – so one achievement was that we got the terms longer for the next group. Uh, the other thing that I think that we can be really satisfied with was that through a direct meeting that we were involved with, um, 
the prisoners program was shut down. So the the there was a there was a system in Victoria where prisoners were um, able to talk to school kids. Mm. Right. Um, so and typically it was a legal studies. Children would go into a year, year eleven or year twelve legal study. Students would go and visit prisoners in a jail. Yeah. And this was sort of baffling to me. And we found out that the person who killed Pat was talking to kids. Yeah. Not only just talking to kids, but he actually spoke to some kids from Eltham. Wow. From Eltham High. And we thought, what the hell? Yeah. This was all happening within six months of him going into jail. And we were, we were told that, you know, for a prisoner to participate in this program, it was a privilege yeah. that you had to earn. And this guy had been in jail for six months. It's like, what the hell? Yeah. And then we, because we, we, you don't get told anything about where, where they go to jail. Yeah. So as a consequence, we found out that he was at Castle Main, yeah. which is a prison farm, mm. compared to you know um, uh, Barwon yeah. or you know where he should have been, you know because people who kill people go to hard jail, not easy jail. Yeah. All of a sudden he's in an easy jail. We're thinking, what the hell? Yeah. What the hell's going on here? So through that, um, we. You know, we, we just happened to have a victims of crime meeting, you know, I think a, a week or so after it came to light that he was talking to kids. Mm. I, mean, I, I just raised the issue and said, how the hell can he have possibly qualified to be talking to anyone, um, be, be afforded these privileges? Did he have a working with children check? He's killed someone. Yeah. Right. So, you know, um, and then at the same time there was another guy who killed David... Cassi, um, he was playing footy up at Myrtleford. Wow. Because he was getting released out, of, oh, I think it was Myrtleford, he was released from, you know, Beechworth Prison or something like that, you know, to go and play footy. And it was like, this is a guy who killed someone. Yeah, he doesn't, so you think about sport, right. you've played sport, how does he have the right to be playing football against someone? I mean, imagine the barbs that could have come, because people would have known who he was, and he was a big guy. Yeah. Um, this is a guy who's capable of killing someone with his own hands yeah. and he's out there playing footy. Um, now, I'm all for rehabilitation and stuff like that, but there's certain privileges that should never be afforded to some people. Yeah. And, you know, playing footy is one of them. You yeah. know, because you think about, think about, you know, again, if you're, you're playing on someone and you know they've killed someone, you're probably not going to play as hard as you might have done otherwise. So that's not fair for you. Yeah. And then you might come against someone who says, well, I'll, I'll bait this guy. So it's not fair on him yeah. either because all of a sudden someone has a crack at him and he says, well, I can't do anything back Yeah, exactly. because if I do something, I'm in strife. Mm. Why put him in that position? Yeah, so, that's mind-boggling. That yeah, yeah. Are, but but the, 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 the bit that – so we raised this in this meeting and the, and the minister had no idea about this. Yeah. It's like, what the hell? They shut, it, shut the program down the next week. Yeah, which was fantastic for me, yeah. um, and I, I think it was a real fist pump moment for our our committee. Yeah, because we were vocal about it, and we were said, "No way, this should not happen." Yeah. Then they came back, and and then they said, "Oh, we're modifying the program," and we got that changed. You know, to the extent where they they classify crimes at different levels, um, and you know, previously it was you couldn't qualify for this program if you were a murderer. Yeah. But if you were convicted of manslaughter, you could. Well, they've now actually included manslaughter in that program as well. Yeah. And they still haven't actually opened the program again, the schools program. Yeah. Because they actually, we, what we did is we exposed it to them and they realised, oh, my God. Yeah. Where's our duty of care to the children who are going and it's talking to these? There's none. Yeah. There's none. None at all. So, so I feel really proud that we were able to at least, you know, it, should the program exist? Well, unless it's going to have some um, educational value, it shouldn't exist. Yeah. You know, the, the, the talking to kids one. If it's about trying to scare kids straight, okay, fine. But don't take year 11 legal study students from Eltham High. There. Yeah. Take the kids who are in juvenile detention and stuff like that. Take them to, take them to prison to show them you know, what the other side looks like. To me, it was almost a bit of a... Um, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, you know, an underbelly type thing. You know, it's mm. a bit. It was a bit of a, oh, a bit of a thrill. You know, to say, oh, I've been to jail and I've I've seen this criminal and I've spoken to this criminal. But 
what are they actually getting out of it? It does not teach them anything about the justice system. Yeah. Um, and what it also exposed to at the same time is none of the kids ever talk to a victim. Yeah. Right? They talk, yeah, they're happy to talk to people who've been found guilty of horrendous crimes yeah. and yet they're actually not seeing the other side of the justice system, which is actually the victim. Yeah. So how is it that we're not even being consulted to say, well, would you be interested in talking to some kids about your experience through the justice system? I'd stick my hand up. Yeah. And and plenty of other people would as well. Yeah. So, you know, so that's, yeah, it would really just expose, you know, the, the, the lack of due diligence that was in place, which has been in place, and to be fair to the current government, it's not the current government's fault. Yeah. It was there for generations before them. But how is it that no one's ever sort of really challenged this? And this is what, as I said, that was the, the dumbfounding part to me as a victim of crime, yeah. you know, on that committee, is to say we can't be the first ones talking about this, surely. Yeah. You know, so anyway, we, we did achieve something. No, that's good that you managed to yeah. achieve that and get that yeah. shut down. That's uh, yeah. that's outrageous. Um, yeah. Dealing with COVID was obviously tough for everyone. Mm-hmm. Charities and foundations were, mm-hmm. you know, no strangers mm-hmm. to that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned before the BYS ball, which you've got coming up um, on the nineteenth of June. Yep. Talk about how important that's going to be for the foundation to you know have that yeah. sort of event in person as opposed to you know last year. Yeah, oh, look, I think it's it's hugely important. I think it just gives us something positive to focus on. Yeah, you know? and look, I mean the take up's been great. You know, we've sold four hundred tickets already. We've still got one hundred and fifty tickets to go, but. You know, the fact is when we when we started the, this process at the time, we could only have 260 people there. Yeah. With the re- easing of restrictions, it's meant we've been able to increase it to 400 and now 520. Yeah. So, you know, we're very hopeful that in five weeks' time we're going to have a full house. Yeah. And, you know, again, I think what it does is it, it, it becomes one of our marquee events mm-hmm. um, and it's about sort of putting us on a stage, you know, the foundation and our message on a stage that's right up there. And, you know, we're trying to attract more and more people from broader than just, you know, the Diamond Valley. Yeah. So, you know, we're quite deliberate to set the Melbourne Town Hall. It's not at the Heidelberg Town Hall, yeah. you know, like so many functions we've all been to over the years. This is a Melbourne, you know, this is a Victorian thing. Eventually it'll be a national thing. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Melbourne's always going to be our heartland. So it's a real opportunity for us to, you know, get some pretty important people in the room yep. and, you know, and hopefully future partners for us as well. Yeah. That's great, Yeah. The your work spreading that the be wise message is you know far from done and you know probably will never be done. Yep. Um, what's next for the foundation and and where you sort of you and the family sort of want to take it? Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I mean, I think our ultimate aim is that it has a life of its own. Mm-hmm. That Robin and I can sit back and not have to be driving it like yeah. we do at the moment. And I, you know, as I said, I mentioned the Alana and Madeline Foundation before, and it's got its own life now. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a very successful charity. Its messages are fantastic. And, you know, look, I think we we want to follow, you know, those good examples. So for us it's about you know, education, changing people's behaviours is really what it's it's all about. And we've got to get out to more and more kids. You know, yeah. this year we're targeting 400 schools, 100 sporting clubs and community groups. Mm-hmm. That's what we're looking to do this year. So next year will be more. You know, we might want to try and double that again next year. Yeah. The only way we can do that is with corporate support and government support. So we've got a, a partnership with the Victorian government, which is a start, but it's still not enough to allow us to double in size. Um, you know, we're, we're reaching out to a number of corporates and we're getting some support from that, which is great because the message is resonating with them. Yeah. So, you know, because every presentation we do these days is there's no cost to the organisation. It was a big mind shift last year where we, we changed our, our, our direction 180, 180 degrees where previously we charged a fee to do a presentation yeah. and we were getting some resistance because of cost. Yeah. So we said, let's take that off the table. Yeah. Let's make the cost our issue, not mm-hmm. theirs. Yeah. And so therefore we now offer our presentations at no cost to the organisation. Our job is to go and get the sponsorship and the, and the government funding to help us deliver that. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a challenge, um, you know. But I'm a financial planner, and yep. you know, I can. I'm not afraid to talk to anyone yeah. these days. So I'm, I'm happy to talk to anyone, uh, but I need to be get get. I need those introductions because again, what we've found is, like at schools and, and sporting clubs, when we tell our story, people listen. Yeah, and they can't argue with us. No, they right? can't. So. You know, and if we can make the world a better place to be, you know, a safer place for Emma and a safer place for Lucas and for Robin and myself, by extension, it's going to be safer for everyone. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. No, look, Matt, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. It's an incredible story and the work that you, you know, Robin and the rest of your family and everyone involved in the foundation do is such an incredible thing. And sharing Pat's story, I can imagine, is something that's, you know, is difficult in some aspects, but it's such a powerful story that it, it resonates with so, so many people. And so I thank you for doing that and, and thank you for the time and wish you all the best with what's next for the foundation. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Nice. Yep. Yep.